Good morning, everybody. Thank you for all joining us today. I want to start off by thanking these wonderful people behind me today. Amanda, Madejani, Saik Shajan, and Rahima Payman. Thank you for them for joining me up here this morning. I want to also thank them for being tireless advocates for Afghan refugees. I have seen firsthand the work they do to try and get Afghan refugees to safety every single day. It is because of the work of the NGOs and the veterans such as Aman Lara and people like Saik and Rahima and countless others that former Canadian forces, Afghan refugees, Afghan interpreters with significant enduring ties to Canada and their families have been able to escape the Taliban. This is despite the bureaucratic red tape that has put hurdles in the way of NGOs, veterans groups and Canadians wanting to help Afghans get out of harm's way. The unfortunate truth is there are too many Afghans still stuck in third countries at risk of deportation back into the hands of the Taliban and countless more stranded are in Afghanistan. And why? It's because the Liberal government failed to plan or prepare for this crisis. Almost one year ago, the Liberals announced the special immigration measures for Afghan nationals who work for the government of Canada. And instead of planning, preparing and surging workforce resources for IRCC and GAC to appropriately address the Afghan crisis, the Prime Minister called a selfish and unnecessary election. GAC, IRCC, DND, and the government were thrown into caretaker convention. There was a complete failure to be creative in the face of bureaucratic hurdles involving life or death situations. The government has still not learned the lessons of their weak response to the Taliban takeover. Instead, they're doubling down and patting themselves on the back for a job well failed. Our Afghan allies remain in limbo. Their lives are on the line, and rather than helping refugees coming to Canada, this Liberal government is shutting down the special immigration measure for Afghans who assisted the government of Canada and the Canadian Armed Forces. According to the IRCC, out of the roughly 16,500 Afghans who've made it to Canada since August 2021, only 7,200 applicants have actually entered through this special immigration measures program. It took the government a year to process less than half of the Afghans who applied through these measures. My colleagues and I know firsthand that countless applicants who applied near the onset of the programs have yet to hear back from IRCC. They have only got auto replies and empty promises from the department. The government's decision to shut down the SIM is unconscionable. While winding down these programs to new applicants is shameful, it ignores that only half of the promised 40,000 Afghans have made it through the bureaucratic mismanagement. The refugee cases that my colleagues and I are still receiving in our offices tells a heartbreaking story of Afghan refugees that have been ignored by IRCC. The incompetency of how this government has run this program cannot be an excuse for Canada to turn its back on Afghans who are desperate for answers and those that risk their lives to serve this country. This is not a partisan issue. This is about doing the right thing and doing it now. Today, Conservatives are calling on this government to finally act on the following steps. To reopen the special immigration measure for Afghans who, assist, uh, who assisted the government of Canada. Adopt the IRCC recommendations of the Special Committee on Afghanistan immediately including conducting a formal all-of-government review of the Liberal response to the crisis and develop future planning to be better prepared for a similar crisis. Expand relations with trusted organizations on the ground within Afghanistan to facilitate the movement of Afghans across the border. And lastly, double efforts to commit to effectively coordinate with allied third-party countries to accelerate the processes needed to approve Afghans for entry into Canada. Those who served with our military and diplomatic missions in Afghanistan sacrificed for a better future in their country. They hoped they were going to contribute to a future of democracy, safety, and freedom. Now, they are all targets of the Taliban. We have a moral responsibility to help those who served alongside our country. We cannot leave them in the grasp of a terrorist regime. Not only does this government need to learn from their failure to make sure this never happens again, but Canada needs to get our allies to safety 
because it is the right thing to do. Now is not the time for talking points or letting Afghan cases get lost in the liberal-made immigration backlog. Now is the time for action. This is a matter of life and death. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Amanda, and I'm a veteran of the Canadian Armed Forces. I never served in Afghanistan, and my service was short. But I have been honoured to volunteer alongside a group of Afghan vets who have been working tirelessly to assist Afghans that they worked with during our military and diplomatic missions. Prior to and during the fall of Afghanistan, I assisted in evacuating some of those who were most at risk to a network of safe houses that ultimately were shut down because the Government of Canada refused to provide any assistance. What we really need is for Canada to lift the current cap on the special immigration measures and provide consideration to those who have been referred by the Department of National Defence and Global Affairs for safe passage. We also need a framework implemented that will ensure those who are facing danger and extreme hardship under the current Taliban government receive safe passage. I could speak endlessly to the efforts of the many volunteers who have been working around the clock for more than a year trying to help people who meet the criteria under the special immigration measures to access this program. Instead of that, I am going to read a note that I received on Canada Day by an Afghan that was responsible for feeding our troops. Thank you very much for taking the time to explain the process in detail. I sincerely hope the Government of Canada either faces this situation directly or just tells us to go away. Their indifference to our situation is depressing, and God knows how many good men will lose their lives while Canada tries to solve their own puzzle of senseless bureaucracy. I'm not hopeless and I never give up easily, but now based on facts, it seems that I have to try and get a life here in Afghanistan and stop waiting for Canada. Instead of asking the Canadian government to face the crisis with respect and honor, it would be much more beneficial and easy to face the situation with courage myself here in Afghanistan and see what the fate has in store for me and thousands more like me. Today is the 1st of July, 2022, and I applied to the program on the 29th of July, 2021. This long wait hasn't had any benefit and waiting any longer while in strict hiding doesn't make any sense. It seems as though those who worked with Canada's, Canada's armed forces were and are disposable and should be discarded. I'm truly honored to have met your acquaintance and I am sincerely thank you for all of your nonstop work to get me to safety but it seems I am not destined to have a peaceful life. I wish everyone who has reached Canada good luck and wish patience to those who are trying. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Rahima. I'm one of the new immigrants uh, to Canada in 2021. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Canadian Parliament for providing me with this opportunity to be able to share my thoughts about the immigration of Afghans to Canada. I am one of the very lucky people who were evacuated in August 2021. As a woman, this was the best things that could happen to me. Since that time, the Taliban have made it impossible for women to work or even leave their homes without a male relatives. Coming to Canada gave me the feeling of security and physical safety. But while I am free in this country, I still have family members who are in harms. Uh, of my previous uh, service, of who are in harms of my previous services uh, to this country during Canada's diplomatic mission within the Afghanistan. Uh, I'm the so financial supporter of my younger brother, who was uh, since who was a student in Turkey. So um, we applied for his safe passage to Canada many months ago. He is one of the lucky ones who have uh, had a response from IRCC and he has been provided with application and UCI number. However, it has been nearly eight months since he has had any further response. There has uh, been no update about the, progress, uh, about the progress of his application, and we 
do not know what is that that IRCC needs from us in order to help my brother find safety. Going back, uh, uh, if my brother go back to uh, go back to Afghanistan, I'm sure his life will be at risk. Many of my colleague businesswomen who also supported Canada have also applied under the special immigration measures that Canada, Canada which opens up in response to the crisis in Afghanistan. Unfortunately, none of them have received any response at all. Those women are highly educated and were working in different sectors. Since the Taliban has taken over Afghanistan, these women can no longer work. Most of them are in hiding because, their because of their services in Canada has made them a target for their current government. Some of these women were the sole financial provider of their families. Those with no, uh, no, male, family, uh, no male family member to support them are forced to suffer with no assistance made even worse as a result of Canada's recognizing the Taliban as a terrorist organization and its policy change to stop sending foreign aid to Afghanistan. Studying and working for women in Afghanistan was never easy, but progress was being made. Now they are no longer allowed to do either. For the last 20 years, women have fought for our place in society. With the current government, those women who did their best in Afghanistan are now in danger. Their very lives are at risk. I'm requesting you to please not stop supporting women in Afghanistan. They truly need your help. Again, thank you for your hearing me on your behalf. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking Canadian people uh, for helping many Afghans, for helping me and welcoming me to Canada. Honestly, I'm really tired of what I've been doing for the past 11 months. I would like to begin by, by sharing what I was doing or what my colleagues were doing. I was running a very successful law practice in Afghanistan called Shajan and Associates. Shajan and Associates was contracted by the government of Canada in Afghanistan April of 2013. We have a nine-year working relationship with the government of Canada. In a lot of cases, we were the true face of the Embassy of Canada, working from presidential palace to local offices within the government of Afghanistan. That included the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Interior, Ministry of Finance, Governor's Office, local courts, you name it. We would be there acting on behalf of the Embassy of Canada. We were happy. None of us, we really wanted to get out of Afghanistan until this crisis happened, right? When it happened, we found ourselves to be in danger. What options we had? We found out about Canada's generous program that, that offered to help those that they had an enduring relationship with the government of Canada. Since I was working as embassy's lawyer, I really knew that who had that kind of enduring relationship I thought that we would be the best definition, we would be the best example of an enduring relationship with the government of Canada. I got in touch with, with uh, different officials. Uh, they were very kind, supported us by providing the necessary recommendation letters that would confirm that we had this nine years working relationship with the government of Canada, that would confirm that we were publicly known for our services to the government of Canada in Afghanistan. Those two letters also confirmed that we were at risk even prior to the fall of Afghanistan and hands of Taliban. When we applied, we thought that we would hear very soon, like many other people were hearing from, from the IRCC. Like, like I have a lot of examples of people that they work on projects 12 years ago, 15 years ago, or in a case, there was an organization that was founded just like, like a year and a half ago. They applied and they got the response immediately. In our case, we are still waiting. I was just lucky that I was able to get out of Afghanistan through other means to Doha and then from Doha make it to, to Canada. But my colleagues, it's 11 months that they're at risk. They're mostly in hiding. They're in the one waiting for Canada to respond back to them and help them get out of Afghanistan and come to safety. But they have not hurt. I have done whatever I could during the past 11 months. Literally, I'm asking anyone, I'm begging anyone for help to make sure that I bring these people to safety. But as of now, nothing has really happened. It is really disappointing. It is really disheartening. And I think this is the time that we need to make sure we do things differently. 
Uh, I understand it's not an easy thing to do, right, going through all those immigration process. I also understand what RCC is doing is not easy, but at the same time, we are not talking about a month or two weeks. We are talking about an entirely different situation in Afghanistan where people are at risk. People are living in a society right now that there is no law. It is completely lawless. There is no rule of law. There is no system that you can rely upon. Every day you will see people are taken out by the Taliban. They, they, they simply disappear. No one really know about them. And in, in a case where someone is fortunate or a family is fortunate to follow up on a particular case of a disappeared person, the, the response from the Taliban simply would be that, well, it must be something personal between any Talib who has done that. But there is no commitment, there is no responsibility from the government that what is your responsibility as a de facto government of Afghanistan right now? People are at risk right now just because of their services to the government of Canada. And I ask, and also, first of all, let me thank you, the media, that, that you have kept this issue alive. Otherwise, it would have been like under the dust already. Uh, I think this is a time that, that the Canadian people, the press, really ask the government of Canada, and I ask that too, to lift the cap that you have for these people who really supported the Canadian mission in Afghanistan. Uh, we need to keep the program open. There are a lot of Afghans, like, like you know, we are not talking about Canada, we are talking about Afghanistan. Access to internet is not easy. A lot of these people that are in hiding, they did not have the opportunity to submit their interest or submit their application to the IRCC. And now closure of that program is like really means an end of, of any opportunity to those people. I would also strongly recommend that we apply as much resources as we can to make sure that this is really working uh, better than what it is right now. Uh, Canada has done so many wonderful things in Afghanistan during the past 20 years, uh, which as an Afghan, I greatly appreciate that. And I'm sure I do not want to see that to be overshadowed by this disgraceful abandonment, abandonment that's going on. And I'm sure Canadian people would also not want to see that. Thank you so much. We will now proceed to questions. We'll take questions in the room. And for those on Zoom, you may use the raise hand function. Hi there, Stephanie Taylor with the Canadian Press. Thanks so much for your time. I was wondering if this question is kind of directed at Rahima and Seed. Um, since the fall of Afghanistan, we've seen Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and we've seen the world and Canada's attention turn to that. Is there a fear on your part that not only Canada, but the Allies' attention to that crisis has deflected or somehow impacted their ability to continue to respond to helping Afghans make their way to Canada? I'll just add a quick sure. note then yeah, sure. for sure. I just want to highlight the fact that, um, you know, rightfully so, the, the people sh did step up for Ukrainians. That, that's our our obligation and duty. At the same time, the responses that we're getting from in my office and from across Canada now are they're seeing a, a, a bias between the two. And Canada sh used to be a beacon of hope. Canada was a leader. And it should continue to do that. It should be a leader when it comes to helping those that are being persecuted around the world. And we hear stories all the time that there's, you know, resources that should be used across the board evenly. And right now it's because of the mismanagement under this liberal government in immigration. We've never seen this many backlogs in the history of Canada. And it's causing many, many hardships to all sorts of people that are trying to come to Canada. And the government needs to step up and not forget the people of Afghanistan. Closing this program is more proof. First, when they should have been doing an evacuation plan last year, the prime minister was busy doing an election plan. So he failed on that part. And now we're seeing the same failure again, that it feels like they're abandoning those that served Canada. Well, thank you so much for the question. I'm oh, oh, sorry. Thank you so much for the question. I think as an Afghan, I'm 43 years old, and all my 43 years have been in war. I really feel the Ukrainian peoples, they do deserve to be helped in any way that it's possible. I wish I could do something to help them. 
But this does not mean that that should be done at, at expense of Afghan people. This that does not mean that Afghan people should, should be abandoned. And the way that we see it, I think numbers are really telling that, right? The way that Ukrainians are helped, that's great. Keep on doing that. But at the same time, we need to help at the same speed, at the same rate, all those Afghans that they are in danger right now just because of their services to the Canadian mission in Afghanistan. Thanks. I'll ask you to stay at the mic. I I'm interested to know... Um, when you communicate with folks in Afghanistan still or hiding elsewhere, what do you hear from them about what communication they might re be receiving from um, immigration bodies in Canada? Is the Canadian government, according to people you talk to, are they still communicating with them? Is, is communication no longer there, not just for Internet access reasons, but in terms of just providing answers? Well, so... I'm in touch with my people, like the group who was working with me at Shajan and Associates. Canada, Embassy of Canada's lawyers in Afghanistan, as well as many, many other lawyers, human rights activists, a lot of them, they have not received any response from the IRCC for the past 11 months, from the time that they have submitted application. No response at all, apart from that automated reply that they would get. Also, there are so many examples, like Rahima's brother is a very good example, that they received the UCI number, they received the G number, but then, again, there's lack of response for the last several months. And I think that is something that really needs to stop. We need to expedite the process. If we need to apply more resources, I think we should do that. We are not talking about a routine immigration system where someone is trying to bring a family member to Canada and you can wait, the person is somewhere safe, let's say, in India, in Pakistan, or other countries of the world, right? They're just waiting for that family member to be reunited. We are talking about people who are at risk right now just because of the services they provided to the Canadian mission in Afghanistan. And it really needs to change now. Thanks. Sure. I'll just, I'll just add briefly to that as well. Um, you know, Afghanistan right now, the people of Afghanistan, even when they're waiting outside in third countries, Minute by minute, hour by hour, their lives are at risk. This is not something small that they're even safe in some of the third countries they're in because we know that they're in some troubling situations wherever they are. And because of the delay by the Canadian government in processing, some people don't have their UCI numbers, people don't have their G numbers, and it's been months. And they either get left on auto-reply or no reply, and it's because of the mismanagement. And what has, what's happening in some cases is that some people that are stuck in third countries are their visas are running out where they are and then they're having to go back into the hands of the Taliban. There's very unfortunate cases that come to my office all the time where one week a family comes, they have a brother or sister or a family member who is, they're applying desperately to get them to Canada and the next week they come to my office and sadly say that they've been killed by the Taliban, that you have to, you know, we, we don't want to go through with this process. So the delays are causing not just hardships, but lives right now. This is something that we need to look at. These are not just numbers. To put a cap on the numbers was unacceptable, in, in our opinion, in the first place. And the, the fact that it's taking so long, we saw an example last year of a 10-year-old girl last year that was killed by the Taliban waiting to come to Canada. And that 10-year-old girl deserved a future here to, to be able to be like some of these people that are here but she couldn't because of the delays. And the veterans groups that were helping them said it was all due to the delaying process that the Canadian government has put the burden on our immigration system. So this is a complete failure in leadership. And this immigration backlog that the Liberals created themselves is causing these problems. We will now proceed to taking questions virtually. Uh, first question will be Rafi Bujkani, CBC. You may unmute yourself and go ahead. Thank, thanks very much. Hi, my question is for uh, Mr. Halan. Um, the government says there are other immigration streams available for people who didn't um, get a chance to apply, I guess, through the Special Immigration Measures Program since the 18,000 limit was reached. Uh, what's your response to that idea? Well, thank you for the question, Rafi. It's completely unacceptable that the government is throwing people from one bureaucratic mess into another. They should be stepping up and showing leadership. They should be continuing this program. And I'll give you an example of, of the mismanagement. When I sponsored a persecuted family from Afghanistan myself in 2015, it took four years 
for this Liberal government to get that family here. And as we've been stating, every minute and every hour in Afghanistan is dangerous for those that are living there. And if they're living in third countries, they're not safe there either. And with this Liberal government, anything that's under their watch or any file that they touch, it's been a complete mess. And now the minister is saying, let's throw them from one bureaucratic mess into another when they can, they can continue this program. So it's completely unacceptable that they're doing that. They need to show some leadership now. They've continued to fail in Afghanistan, and this is their time to do what's right and serve those that served Canada. Thanks very much. And as a follow-up, raising the 18,000 goal would effectively mean raising the overall 40,000 goal. So are you saying the Canadian government should be accepting more than 40,000 Afghans? Um, I think the government needs to be clear on why, why they set that cap in the first place, where they came up with those numbers. And if there are more people applying to it that have served our country, then of course that should be expanded. That number, that cap should go up. The fact of the matter is that we don't know completely because there's no transparency from the Liberal government about which cases are included in those 18,000 and which aren't. There's many cases in my office that have not received UCI numbers or G numbers. Are those included in that 18,000 or not? So there's a lack of transparency and accountability, and they need to be more clear on what's included in that number and why they set that number. And if there are more people that have served Canada, then we need to make sure that they, they can get here. Thank you. Hey, if there's any other questions on Zoom, please use the raise hand function. We have a question in the room. Uh, just given your uh, uh, the gravity of the situation for those in Afghanistan, you're very tempered in your um, response. This has been going on uh, not just a year. It's been we've been involved in Afghanistan for uh, a long time, for as people can remember. There are those in Canada that would would say this is on the other side of the world. It, it, it really doesn't impact us. What would you say to those people? Like, if you had a chance directly to say to those people, what would be, what would you say, and even to the immigration minister or the prime minister, like, to get this moving? Look, I want to uh, thank you for the question. Uh, firstly, I want to thank all the NGOs, the veterans groups that have stepped up because the Liberal government has failed to do so. They have been there from day one inside of Afghanistan trying to get those people out. And to your question... We have to remember these are people from Afghanistan that served alongside with our troops and they risk their lives to serve Canada. And this is the time when Canada needs to step up and help serve those that served Canada. This is my clear message that the Prime Minister has failed, the Immigration Minister has failed. And when the rest of our allies were preparing for an evacuation plan. For those that served their countries, this prime minister called a selfish election, abandoning those that served Canada and was more focused on an election plan that resulted in absolutely no change. And this is, this is where we keep seeing failure over and over again. The prime minister's reputation on the world stage, he's become a laughingstock. And due to that, our allies have left us out when they're planning to evacuate their troops. This is when we need to get together with our allies, then they should have done this last year, is when the, our allies were getting ready to evacuate those that served their countries, Canada should have been right there at that table doing the same thing. But because of the lack of preparation and complete failure in Afghanistan under the civil government, it didn't happen. And we continue to see more failures now. They abandoned people then, and now they're abandoning more people now. Mr. Matt, please. Last chance for anyone on Zoom to use the raise hand function. We have no further questions. Oh, we got one other question from Rafi. Go ahead, Rafi. I mean, I'll go again if no one else is going to ask a question. Um, Mr. Halam, can you 
react to you know the government constantly saying this is a very different challenge than you know the Syrian refugee evacuation effort in 2015 just uh, in terms of you know obviously the Taliban being uh, completely uncooperative governments the the lack of diplomatic relationships with uh, some of the third countries surrounding Afghanistan where some Afghans have already fled complicating the effort of getting them even out of there um, wh what do you make of uh, of those challenges in the in the Canadian government's way? Uh, thank you for the question. And it just goes to highlight, again, the failure on a world stage by this Liberal government. They should have had better relations in the first place. And as I said before, when our allies were getting prepared and, and you know, having discussions amongst each other and with other, other governments to make sure that they got their troops out of there and into safety, this Liberal government was just sitting on its hands as usual. No one was communicating with them, and it shows how, how bad of a reputation under this Liberal government Canada has with its allies. They should have been talking to people ahead of time. We know through the testimony that took place in the Special Committee in Afghanistan that UNHCR had given briefing that Kabul was going to fall as early as January of 2021. And once again, the Prime Minister sat on his hands, the Immigration Minister sat on their hands, and they did not prepare for what was to come when Kabul fell. It was time to show leadership. They failed then, and they're continuing to fail now. So when we look at the, the way that Canada's reputation has, has been over the last six years under the Liberal government, it's been diminishing under Justin Trudeau. I, I just would like to add, as I said earlier, I, I, I do understand that it's not an easy process, right? It, it does require a lot of work uh, to be done. But at the same time, what I see and what I'm frustrated at is that we did not receive any response from my colleagues. Had we had any, at least a case number or something for them, I think right now I have a lot of support in Canada. I have support in, in, in other places. Uh, almost all major Canadian law firms are supporting my cause, and we would have used other resources to make sure get those people out of Afghanistan. I know working with the Taliban is difficult, right? So here, what we could do personally to make sure really get those people out, but, but the fact that, that we haven't heard anything from the government, from the IRCC, that is really disheartening. Thanks. Uh, Rafi, I'll just add one, one other point to it, that we have been putting forward some common sense solutions and that's why we're asking for the, uh, the measures or the, the recommendations out of the special committee in Afghanistan to be implemented immediately. Us as conservatives, we put forward through the help of the other veterans organizations and NGOs, a very common sense solution to help speed up things when we ask for single journey documents to be implemented. The immigration minister, Sean Frazier, stood up in the House of Commons and aggressively turned that idea down when it was being called for to help get away from this bureaucratic red tape in immigration that the Liberals have created. And yet, when after saying no, after two weeks, they accepted it. And even to date, they haven't been able to implement that properly. It's a complete failure. People are still being left on auto reply or no reply at all. So it's to show that, you know, we're all trying to work collaboratively and not making this a partisan issue. But the process and the, the delay, it's costing lives. So we're asking them to speed up and do what's necessary to help those people that serve Canada. And that's it for questions.